Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to Saturday Morning Physics. I'm Roy Clark, professor here at the University of Michigan and co-host of this event. Today, it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Professor Jens Christian Miners of the U of M's Biophysics Department. Chris earned his undergraduate and doctoral degrees at the University of Constance in Germany and uh, joined the physics faculty here at Michigan after postdoctoral studies at Caltech. Shortly after the biophysics program became a fully-fledged department about 10 years ago, Chris was appointed chair of that new department and was responsible for putting together a brand new, <clears throat> a brand new undergraduate program for biophysics and completely redesigning its graduate curriculum, and it was a huge success. So congratulations on that. Chris is a leader in <clears throat> Chris is a leader in researching living systems from a physical science perspective, including the mechanics of the different processes involved. And uh, most recently, he has been interested in studying how decompression gas bubbles, known as the bends, can damage spinal cord tissue, and this is, this is a very important development, in, obviously, for the, for the physics of diving and um, in understanding the basic mechanism of, uh, of what the bends can do. He's the recipient of the Harold Early Research Award and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Fellowship Award, and in 2019, he received a special award from the diving community, namely the Hamilton Award from the Divers Alert Network. And um, he's going to talk about some of that work uh, this morning. I was really delighted uh, when Chris agreed to give a talk on uh, the life aquatic. Uh, which happens to be one of my favorite recreational activities. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> I'm going to call on the audience, uh, both the audience here in, in this room and also um, the uh, remote audience, which is being live streamed, to submit questions, um, which the speaker will be happy to uh, address after the lecture. Uh, either uh, online by email uh, at this address, physics at umich.edu, or just write them on, on a card if you're in the live audience today. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Chris, and please take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction, Roy. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here back in person. This is the first uh, lecture that I'm actually giving live again. So great to see faces again instead of just looking into the webcam. So I'm uh, excited about that. And I'm doubly excited because I get to talk about uh, two passions of mine in one talk. One is the science. Um, my scientific interest is, is about figuring out what's the role of mechanics in biology and to some extent also medicine. So for the most part of my career, I've looked really at the molecular and cellular scale, uh, answering questions like, can mechanical tension in the DNA turn genes on and off, um, and so on. And uh, now more recently, I also got interested in tissue mechanics, and the tissue mechanics project is related to scuba diving, uh, which is my hobby, my other passion. Um, I'm an avid diver, really enjoy everything underwater uh, from here, our shipwrecks in, uh, in the Great Lakes, uh, which are beautiful. There are over a thousand known shipwrecks around here uh, to the caves in Mexico where I spend, uh, whenever I can get away uh, sometime, there are underwater beautiful structures there. So um, two things here in one that I can talk about. Um, and before, I, uh, before we splash, um, how many of you have actually done any scuba diving? Wow, 
Okay, about half of you. So for you, I hope um, I will tell you a little bit uh, more about the science of diving and uh, decompression sickness, which I hope you'll never ever need to uh, ever get, um, and put some of the things that you might have learned in your uh, diving courses in, uh, in context a little bit, in the scientific context. And for those of you uh, who have uh, have no experience with diving whatsoever. I hope I'm not going to turn you off from sco ever trying scuba diving by talking about one of the uh, po uh, potential risks of the activity. Uh, overall, it's quite safe as long as you know what you're doing. So um, with that, let me get started, tell you a little bit about what do we mean when we talk about uh, decompression. So um, decompression that's a rapid drop of the ambient pressure in whatever environment you're in. Uh, diving is probably the most common context in which that happens. When you're at depth, um, you experience a, a larger pressure uh, than at the surface, and we'll get into this a little bit more uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, but there are other scenarios where that happens as well. Um, high altitude aerospace operations is one of those, and that's why NASA is interested in this topic as well. Um, for instance, spacesuits are pressurized only to about a third of an atmosphere, uh, but the pressure in the, in, the, uh, in the space station is the same as here on Earth. So you have a drop of two thirds, a pressure drop of two thirds of the pressure uh, once uh, the astronaut locks out uh, and uh, does a spacewalk. So that's a big decompression uh, thing uh, right there. Then another example, and that's historically probably the most important one, is um, Casson construction. Uh, that's a construction technique um, in, which, uh, the, um, in which you have a, basically an enclosure, uh, and you pressurize that enclosure to keep water out. So that was, for instance, how the Brooklyn Bridge was built. So the workers are actually uh, down there. This is the third uh, picture. Let me see if I can get the laser pointer here. So uh, here, this is a picture of how the Brooklyn Bridge was built. Um, so you have this uh, basically a cavern here. It's pressurized uh, to two to three atmospheres from, uh, from the top side to keep the water of the East River out. And um, when this was done, uh, actually it was noticed um, a lot of those um, uh, workers got sick. And um, initially, back then, it was first ascribed to, oh, well, just the working conditions. It's cold down there, hard work, uh, hard work for the entire shift. But eventually, uh, it was realized it had actually something to do with getting up from uh, two and a half atmospheres or so down here uh, to atmospheric pressure uh, very rapidly. And so that's what we know as uh, decompression illness. So ex excessive decompression uh, can lead to physical symptoms. So, um, what are those symptoms? There we go. Um, it's a very complex mix of symptoms. You may have some, rarely anyone has all of them, um, but very common are neurological problems, anything from a, a tingling uh, in, uh, in your fingers uh, to, in extreme cases, paralysis, pulmonary symptoms, shortness of breath, joint pain is also very common, skin rashes, and many more things. So um, it's a very complex set of symptoms, and uh, actually decompression sickness is fairly hard to diagnose accurately clinically. It's usually done, well, you came up too fast, so chances are that you will probably have, have the bends. And, um, but um, because these symptoms are also so common uh, otherwise, so uh, it's often, oh, well, maybe I just hurt myself, hurt my shoulder carrying my tank or something like that. And uh, that is actually a bit of a problem that there's no single good test for um, whether you are actually have decompression sickness or not. So um, let's talk a little bit about pressure, pressure at depth here, what your body is experiencing there. Um, and starting point here is, um, well, pressure, the pressure that your body experiences increases with depth. So let me show this here in a very simple experiment. We have a water column here. Uh, this water column, just about a meter here. And you'll see that just across this water column here, there's a substantial pressure difference. So I have here three orifices that I can open. And you can see already how the water pressure increases here from top to bottom um, um, and shooting out faster and faster as we uh, get lower here um, in, the, uh, in the water column. So pressure increases quite rapidly uh, with increasing depth. 
and well, how much does it increase? Um, well, here at the surface, we have, an, uh, have one atmosphere of pressure. As you start going down deeper and deeper, um, every 10 meters, you add one atmosphere to the pressure that your body experiences here. And how much is now one atmosphere? Well, uh, one atmosphere that's also known as 14.7 pounds per square inch, uh, to visualize this a little bit, this is a steel bar here that weighs 14.7 pounds, has a cross-section of one square inch, and it is heavy. It is a lot of pressure here on my hand right now, and that's just one atmosphere. And you get one atmosphere every 10 meters, so the um, limit of recreational diving is about 40 meters. Uh, so you have one atmosphere from, from the air plus another four of those from the water on you. So that's a lot of pressure. And what are the consequences of this? The first one um, is that air spaces shrink. So if you have an air space, in particular your, your lungs, and you compress that air space, what's going to happen is it's going to shrink. And um, for that, we have another little experiment here that I can show you. So here we have a diver with a little bit of an, uh, yeah, we can, we can get the, maybe. Not coming on. Nope. Wrong one. Yes. So we have a little diver here, um, and there's a bit of an airspace here at the top. And um, what's now, what I can do now is uh, compress, add pressure here to my water column just by compressing the air top side. And what's going to happen is the airspace here in my diver, in my diver's lung, is going to shrink. I don't even need to apply very much pressure here. And what's going to happen is you see the airspace shrinking. And because of that, he even loses buoyancy and just dives down there. So just compressing the airspace here a little bit uh, can have some fairly, uh, fairly substantial effects here. And this was just me squeezing a little tube here. If we now go down here to, let's say, um, 40 meters, uh, uh, then we add here to, uh, so we add another four atmospheres to it. And uh, the effect of shrinking the airspace becomes very substantial, so at uh, four atmospheres, uh, at, yeah, at, uh, at four atmospheres, uh, the airspace is only about, uh, only a quarter of uh, what it's actually at the surface. So airspaces shrink very dramatically. And um, that would, at least in principle, preclude diving because your, your lungs can't really uh, work against such big pressures, and that's why we actually need to breathe compressed air um, if you try to do this with a snorkel, just atmospheric pressure, uh, about a meter or so would, uh, would be the limit what your lungs can actually, um, the uh, force that your lungs can actually generate. Uh, so that's not going to work. We are actually breathing, for that reason, compressed air to fill those air spaces back up uh, with, with a pressure uh, that corresponds to your depth here. So, you're at, um, so here at, um, uh, at uh, uh, 30 meters, you would be breathing. Uh, air that's compressed to absolute pressure of uh, four atmospheres or three atmospheres above, uh, above atmospheric. So that's how that part works. And now, um, what does that actually mean for, uh, for our lungs, that the size of the airspace is so sensitive to, uh, to depth? So if we look at that, um, if we are down there, at the bottom of, let's say, Lake Huron, and fill our, uh, fill our lungs then with compressed air, uh, let's say, uh, four or five atmospheres, um, and we are starting to ascend, then what's going to happen is the gas spaces expand. That means your lung volume expands. And um, if you don't do anything, if you keep all the gas inside your lungs, don't exhale anything while you ascend, well, what's going to happen is um, the lung will, uh, will become overpressurized, so you have more gas pressure inside your lung uh, compared to the external pressure. And, uh, well, what's going to happen then? Uh, your lung is actually made up of these very small um, alveoli, very small sacs here uh, that facilitate the gas exchange between uh, the air side and your, uh, and your bloodstream. And, uh, well, when you pressurize these very, very sensitive uh, alveoli, 
let me show you what's going to happen then. So um, first, let's get this one. Uh, so we decompress the outside. So that's the equivalent of the ascent, the, the pressure on the, uh, the external pressure. Uh, so the pressure inside the lung uh, goes down. And so I'm simulating this here uh, with a, a vacuum pump and our marshmallow. This is your lung tissue or the alveoli. So the marshmallow has all these little, uh, little, um, little bubbles here in them. So I'm reducing the external pressure on the, uh, on the alveoli and they shrink, shrink some more, and then eventually they burst. So what you just saw there is first they expand, they burst. And then now I can even uh, show you that they have really burst if I let the air back in, equilibrate everything, your lung has just collapsed. So um, this here is now equivalent of a total collapse of the lung. Um, that can happen in extreme cases, usually it doesn't. Um, more likely is um, that actually you have now some of these little alveoli here ruptured, and uh, that means now um, gas can actually get from your lung into the bloodstream, on the arterial side of your bloodstream. And um, that's a bad thing. So once you have these little gas bubbles inside your, the arterial side of your bloodstream, so they go then uh, through, the, uh, through, your, uh, through your heart, get, get, and then get eventually pumped into the, into the brain, and a bubble can get stuck there. And what happens when a bubble gets stuck in, uh, in a blood vessel in the brain? That means you have a stroke. And uh, that's uh, one of the uh, bigger uh, uh, dangers there. So uh, from a rapid ascent, a stroke is one of the big risks here because of this mechanism. You rupture some of the alveoli, gas bubbles get into the brain and uh, cause a stroke there. Um, this may sound all very, very bad, but the good thing is there's an easy way around this, um, and um, it just means don't hold your breath when you uh, ascend, and uh, it's not going to happen. So this is just the thing of uh, it doesn't happen very often as long as, uh, as, long as you're careful about uh, how, you, how you dive. So um, that's sort of the direct effects of pressure. We can rupture our lung that way and get bu gas bubbles. Um, into, the, um, into, the, into the bloodstream. Uh, but there's also a somewhat more subtle effect, and that's, uh, called, that's a um, tissue saturation uh, that's dependent on, um, on uh, gas pressure. So again, here, this is our uh, alveola, and um, we already know what it does. Um, it generally, under physiological conditions, uh, oxygen from the air gets dissolved in the blood, gets carried through your body, metabolized and into carbon dioxide, and then you get the carbon dioxide um, uh, back out, and the carbon dioxide is then transferred out here uh, into your lung and exhaled. Uh, so that's sort of basic physiology, uh, but there's also another gas that we usually don't worry about in ordinary physiology, and that's the nitrogen. Nitrogen is inert. So as long as we just stay here at ordinary room pressure or at any constant pressure, uh, the amount of nitrogen doesn't change when it goes through your body, so it just stays here at equilibrium, some diffuses out, but the same amount diffuses back in, and it's just, it's just there. That's what ordinarily happens. Now, when you dive here, going from this situation here, nitrogen here in the air, in equilibrium with nitrogen in the blood, when you dive now, you're starting to compress the air, you're breathing compressed air here. So we have the compressed air, and now um, some of that diffuses into the blood and saturates the blood at your new pressure level. And the concentration at which you get the saturation is proportional to the, to the pressure. So now all of a sudden, sudden we have four or five times as much nitrogen in your bloodstream than you had before. And um, that alone doesn't really pose a, cause, uh, pose a problem. Everything is fine again. Everything is in equilibrium. Nitrogen doesn't do, doesn't do much physiologically. So uh, generally, no issue by you at depth. But now you come up, and you have all your um, nitrogen dissolved here, but the pressure, partial pressure of the nitrogen up here uh, at the surface is much lower. So you have an excess nitrogen in your blood, and that has to come out somehow. 
And this excess nitrogen, by the way, that's called a supersaturation. So we have a supersaturated liquid here. And nitrogen has to come out. And ideally, it would do it exactly the same way as it came in. So extra nitrogen is just uh, diffused out here uh, through the alveoli and eventually exhaled. So that's ideally what would happen. But there's also another mechanism that can happen. And uh, that is this nitrogen, this dissolved nitrogen, can also come out um, as, um, as bubbles. So can form bubbles in the blood. And you probably all know what's going to happen now. Um, we have here, instead of nitrogen, we have carbon dioxide in there. Carbon dioxide is actually very soluble in water. So um, if I have my can here and shake it, um, we all, oops, let me see. So those are the bubbles, and that's what can happen uh, with your blood um, if, you, um, if you get into that situation where you are not exhaling uh, the nitrogen uh, properly. So um, not a good situation. So um, next, I would like to talk a little bit about what these bubbles actually now do in your body when you get them. We already had briefly mentioned the, um, uh, uh, the stroke that you can get, but um, it's fortunately not quite as severe as that generally. Um, the first thing to know there is decompression bubbles almost always form on every single dive, and they form on the venous side of your bloodstream. Why is that? Well, the blood pressure is lower on, on the venous side than on the arterial side, so the pressure difference is bigger, the supersaturation is bigger on the venous side, so that's where the bubbles generally form. And um, we can see this in ultrasound images. So here's an ultrasound um, uh, image uh, of, the, um, of the right side of the heart up there. Um, and what you can see there is uh, lots of bubbles in the heart, and that happens even on very benign dives. It just, uh, it's just a matter, uh, a matter of fact. Uh, you will have bubbles in your bloodstream, uh, unless for the, except for the most shallow, shortest dive, but generally, you will have bubbles there. And, um, well, we already heard earlier, bubbles in the bloodstream is bad, stroke, for instance. Why are we not having a stroke every single time uh, we go diving? Well, the thing is, the lung provides a very effective filter for those bubbles. So, um, we, uh, the, uh, the venous blood here um, gets pumped from the right side of the heart through the lung, and uh, then the lung, um, because it is, really facilitates gas exchange, um, it is able to effectively uh, basically break up the bubbles and exhale that gas. So some bubbles on the venous side here is not an issue really, uh, happens every single time. But when things get problematic is uh, when you start overwhelming this filter here, then you can get some in, into the arterial side, and then we get back to the issues that I already mentioned. Another uh, complication is um, uh, there is a um, uh, heart abnormality. We have a small shunt here between the left and the right side. Uh, that's another way how bubbles can get into the arterial side and cause problems. So um, bubbles alone, generally not the biggest, the biggest problem that we are worried about. Um, let me briefly talk about one other, where is my clicker here? So briefly, this wouldn't be a physics lecture if I wouldn't put at least a little bit of an equation in there. And so let me very quickly tell you about how these bubbles now actually grow when you um, go through ascent and increase supersaturation. Um, they mostly grow through diffusion, so gas molecules can diffuse uh, into, the, into a small seed bubble here. And uh, I don't want to uh, drag you through this, but uh, we can easily calculate how much the amount of gas in the bubble changes here as a function uh, with time. The NDT is something that's proportional to the bubble radius. That's actually quite notable. You would think it's proportional to the surface of the bubble, the amount of gas that you can get in, but it's actually, uh, if you do the calculation, just proportional to the radius. Um, we also have the ideal gas law. Um, nothing special there for those of you who have had a little bit of physics or physical chemistry. We can lump those two things together, uh, get a differential equation where amount of gas in the bubble is proportional to the third root of, um, um, the change in the amount of gas is proportional to the third root of the amount of gas in there. And uh, then 
um, we can calculate uh, what we get. And the main story here is uh, in about, um, it doesn't really matter how big your seed bubble is, as long as you have some kind of seed bubble. Um, after about, um, after about a, a minute or two, they reach sizes here where they become prob problematic, assuming here in the moment a pressure difference of three atmospheres, so popping up from 100 feet down or so. So um, a relatively quick process over minutes, um, and you get some very substantial gas bubbles here. So um, enough of the math. Let's go back to bubbles. Now the question of what's happening if these bubbles don't form in the bloodstream, but if they form in actual tissues. And the most problematic one there clearly is the spinal cord tissue, uh, because that's really, well, uh, where the neurological symptoms uh, can, uh, can arise from. Uh, if it happens in a muscle or so, not such a big deal, but uh, nervous tissue, spinal cord, that's where it matters. So, um, again, we start out with a little seed bubble, seed bubble in equilibrium with the, uh, with the external pressure here at first, and gas, the black dots here, dissolved in the tissue. Now, we have our rapid ascent, and the first thing that happens is this pressure balance is thrown off. We have less external pressure than before, and that means just by expanding gas spaces, the bubble expands instantaneously. But now, unlike in the bloodstream, the tissue itself, it's an elastic material, it opposes that growth, and eventually you reach some equilibrium here uh, where this elastic force from the tissue uh, together with the internal pressure of the bubble balance the external pressure. Uh, so that, that here happens almost instantaneously up to here. And then a slower process kicks in, and that's diffusion. We, just already, we already talked about diffusion into the bubble, so that's that process here. Bubble accretes gas from the tissue here, but then there's also diffusion out of the tissue here into your bloodstream, and that is actually a, f um, a fairly slow process. So at first, the bubble will accrete here gas, and then eventually the tissue here will lose the gas to the bloodstream, and the bubble will shrink down to some new equilibrium. And just to show how slow diffusion actually is, if, it, if I can get that image here. Um, so what I did here, I made a, made a gel as a phantom for a tissue, a bit of agarose, so 99% water, 1% agarose here, and I put it back in there. And this morning at around 7 o'clock, I put a little, injected a little drop, a drop of food dye into it, and now it has spread to a couple of millimeters. So this gives you sort of an idea how fast or how slow diffusion is. So um, to, uh, to get the gas out of your tissue here, uh, that takes typically hours, uh, just to put the time scales here in perspective. So you have a fairly quick growth of the bubble here over uh, minutes, and then for the new equilibrium, this can take hours, or in some very slow tissues, even days. Uh, to get fully all of that out there. So that's what's happening, um, at least schematically, in, in tissues. And a few years ago, I got interested in, uh, can we actually check that experimentally? Um, I needed a small project for our MSI Academies here, a program where we have uh, incoming freshmen participating in small research projects uh, from day one. And um, here, uh, so what we did there was making a gel very much like this here, compressed it to uh, four atmospheres absolute, um, and let it sit there overnight under pressure that it really gets saturated with all the nitrogen, and then decompressed it very rapidly uh, to uh, atmospheric pressure. And this video and took then with a microscope a video of it. Uh, this video here is sped up 60 times, so one second in the video is about one minute in real time. And so we got these kind of videos out of it and noticed two things here. So first, yes, the time scale is, is good, so no big surprise there. The other thing that we saw there is also that um, the bubble sizes are fairly homogeneous. So if I pause this video here for a second. Yeah. So if I pause it for a moment here, um, the, si the sizes Ordinarily, when you think of sort of random bubbles forming, you would think we have lots of big ones, small ones, everything in between, but the size distribution is very homogeneous. And that's, very, that's basically what I already showed you in this little calculation there. Uh, the initial bubble size didn't matter. Everything in the end came back onto this one uh, diagonal line there. So that's pretty good. 
Um, and then the one thing that really surprised us was the shape of these things. All these bubbles look like these lentil shapes here and with fairly sharp cusps at the end. And that was inconsistent with basically any simple mechanical model that you make. Um, and what this was actually telling us, when you see something like this uh, in material science, uh, the first thing you think of there is fracture, cracking. So the mechanical force from this expanding bubble is actually cracking our gel apart, breaking it apart. It's no longer an elastic expansion. So elastic expansion, that was what I had there earlier in my simple model. Um, think of a balloon. You can inflate it as many times as you want it. We would use the pressure or increase the pressure. It always goes back to the same size. But this here is different. Uh, so here we actually get real cracks in the gel here. So we are not seeing just an elastic deformation. We are actually seeing here um, uh, fracture, tearing of the gel. And, well, when we saw that, of course, the question was, um, does that happen in actual biological tissues as well? So, um, what we did was um, we went to a, uh, to a model system, we, uh, to uh, spinal cords of cows, and uh, we picked that, uh, that model system because the mechanical properties actually of bovine spinal cords are reasonably similar to those of humans. And also we had easy access to them. We just went to a local meat processor and asked him, next time you um, uh, butcher some cows, can you give us a spinal cord from a cow? Um, and we got that way also around all the animal issues that you would otherwise have. So we got a couple of these spinal cord samples. Now we still had to image them and um, we couldn't just use a microscope anymore because, well, it's not transparent, these tissues. So um, we went to, our, uh, to North Campus to the biomedical engineering department. They have a small, uh, high resolution small animal MRI scanner, seven Tesla MRI scanner that we could use. And we built a pressure cell a pressure chamber that actually fits into the MRI scanner and is compatible with uh, these high magnetic fields and um, did basically the same experiment that I just showed you with the gel, now with bovine spinal cord inside the MRI scanner and um, compressed our spinal cord here um, for, um, uh, for two days uh, to six atmospheres and then rapidly reduced it and scanned and looked at various time points here. These are here cross sections that we take and we see this bubbles springing up. And that was, of course, quite exciting, actually seeing these bubbles grow in real time. Uh, that's something you usually don't have access to most of the time in the literature when you see about bubbles in tissues. It's always uh, later uh, than uh, histopathology or so, uh, cross sections, uh, much after the fact. So we could actually see them grow in real time here. And uh, you can imagine having a bubble like this in your spinal cord is definitely not a good thing. So, um, so now we started to look into, well, is this again tearing like what we saw in the gels or is it elastic deformation? And in this case, the shape didn't tell us a whole lot. It's such an anisotropic tissue, so um, inhomogeneous. We couldn't really uh, tell much from the shapes of these bubbles. So we devised a different kind of experiment. So what we now did was um, we again compressed the spinal cord here saturated it with nitrogen uh, for two days and then reduced the pressure only by half. Um, so just enough that we um, get small bubbles and again waited for equilibrium. So now we have small bubbles, these seed bubbles in a way that I talked about earlier. Um, and those we can actually see here. Uh, so in line A here, we found, uh, found a bubble here. And uh, then what we did at that point was we wanted to probe the mechanical properties, the mechanical interaction of the bubble with the surrounding tissue. Is it tearing it or is it just elastically deforming it? And we did that by very briefly decompressing it to one atmosphere and recompressing it, five seconds. So very quick reduction in pressure, increase in pressure again. If it's completely elastic, it would always return to the same size. But if it actually fractures the local tissue, rips the tissue there locally, then what's going to happen is the space that the bubble has available increases and it go, gets larger uh, in each, each time. And that's actually what we see here. So uh, after the first cycle here, uh, the original bubble here is marked in red. After the first cycle, uh, you see uh, already a little bit of a 
black rim, then it gets bigger, bigger, and bigger, and then we decompress all together here in the last one, then it gets really, really big. Now you actually have this uh, ideal gas law effect expansion on top of uh, just uh, the increase here from, uh, uh, from fracturing the material. So at this point, we are quite confident to say, at least we are seeing here, some kind of um, irreversible um, deformation, not just elastic behavior. And uh, that now brings me, was something we wanted to understand also quantitatively a little better. I mean, the bubbles, um, the other math worked out so nicely. Can we do something like this here? Well, here it gets really complicated, and we actually went to computer modeling instead. So what we did was build an, a finite element model of the spinal cord um, by taking our MRI images here and um, yeah, basically making a small, uh, dividing, subdividing in little, small little pieces here, a network, a mesh network uh, of little springs, and then uh, looked at the elastic response, what happens when we place a bubble in there and start expanding it. Um, and what we get there is if we go, like in the experiment before, uh, is the, uh, from three atmospheres to one atmosphere, um, and assume an elastic medium, what we get is um, stress inside the spinal cord here, very localized around the bubble. So the stress in the material doesn't go very far. It's very highly localized around the bubble. And also, we can get some numbers out of it if we put the material parameters in that we know for the spinal cord, uh, for spinal cord tissue. And we can see uh, we can easily exceed the yield stress, so the stress that's known to actually tear nerve, uh, nerve tissue apart. We can easily exceed that uh, several fold here. So we have good reason at this point to believe, yes, um, the mechanics is there. Uh, an expanding ga gas bubble in the spinal cord uh, is not just an elastic um, uh, deformation. It is actually... Um, 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 in a way, a traumatic injury, an actual injury, a cutting of the spinal cord that's happening there. So um, what about treating all of this? Standard treatment is recompression inside a pressure chamber. So if you get a DCS hit, uh, what they do is they put you into one of these uh, pressure chambers. This one is a really, really big one. Most of them are actually very, very smaller than that. Um, and compress you typically to somewhere around uh, two, two and a half atmospheres absolute. Uh, so here, um, and um, then uh, they give you pure oxygen and occasionally switch to air, and this, such a treatment takes a couple of hours typically. Um, so this is one that was developed and still used by the U.S. Navy. Um, this does two things. So one is the pressure effect, basically reversing what I've shown you in this idealized graph earlier, so of just compressing externally everything so the bubble shrinks. And the other thing with the oxygen, uh, that is now also pulling the gas out there. Um, oxygen gets metabolized, doesn't contribute to bubble growth. So the uh, nitrogen pressure on the outside is zero then. And so all the nitrogen can diffuse out. And that's really the aim of all of this is dissolve the bubble. And that's certainly good and important. Um, but um, with what we have seen, we ask ourselves also, shouldn't we really also treat this like a traumatic spinal cord injury? So like, real, like little paper cuts in your spinal cord in a way. Um, and um, then this, and the belief that we need to do this um, is also bolstered by some of the clinical observations there. So one of them is that surface oxygen at, so oxygen, normal baric oxygen at atmospheric pressure as a treatment is only partially effective. Um, that's usually the first thing you get when you get a decompression sickness hit or so on a boat or so. The first thing they do is give you 100% oxygen. And with the math that we've done, the bubble math, we would think that uh, probably about two hours or so on pure oxygen uh, would dissolve any bubble uh, pretty much outright. So, but it's known it's only partially effective. It uh, briefly reduces the symptoms a little bit, but everything comes right back when you go, uh, go off the oxygen. You need the uh, recompression treatment, really, uh, to make it work. And uh, the other thing that's clinically known is um, that the initial treatment is very effective when you get it right away. That means within the next hour or two. 
but then when you come in the next day or so, effectiveness goes down dramatically and uh, even worse, um, uh, and uh, what they do actually then is um, they, if it doesn't help, uh, let's say you get the treatment two days later, if it doesn't help, they tell you, come back next day, we do it again, come ba back next day, they do it again. And uh, that is something um, based on what we have seen may not be the best thing to do. So can these additional chamber treatments perhaps ex exacerbate the, the damage here? Um, in a way, that's what we have done here in our experiments. Each time we expand, uh, we co compressed and recompressed uh, our bubble, uh, our spinal cord tissue, every single time we did that, uh, the damage got bigger to the, uh, to the spinal cord. So maybe that's not uh, really the, um, a good way to go about it. And um, related to this is the question of uh, buildup of scar tissue uh, there. In, um, so if, if you think of this as a, as a wound, as a cut, um, if you have, have that, well, what's the first thing you do? Usually you compress it and then you keep it compressed. You stitch it together that it heals well. And this here, every day, oh, has it healed yet? Has it healed yet? Uh, you can imagine that's not a good thing to do. You build up scar tissue there. And um, what that does is uh, then also increases uh, the propensity for future decompression sickness hits um, after, um, after uh, you have been treated uh, for the first one. And this is only anecdotal evidence. It's very, very hard to really get hard data on this one. So uh, please don't mistake the, uh, this uh, as data, as an anecdotal evidence, but there are a good number of those cases. So here's one uh, that I know personally, highly experienced technical diving instructor, uh, did, a, uh, did a dive, um, yeah, not particularly deep, just 22 meters, uh, but for, little, for about two hours um, on a gas mix that had less nitrogen in there, so actually less tissue loading, less nitrogen in the tissue than you would get when you dive, dive on air. Um, and uh, by all diving algorithms or so, um, he was very much on the safe side. He had, uh, had, um, had something like eight minutes of uh, decompression obligation by the standard algorithms uh, to get enough gas out of the body uh, to safely surface. Um, he ascended already so slowly um, that um, basically there was no, uh, no tissue loading left. Ten, and then even played around in sh uh, shallow water even longer. So by all intents and purposes, he should be in completely fine, but he got a neurological DCS hit. Um, and mostly shoulder pain, uh, plus some other neurological symptoms. And uh, of course, well, experienced in, uh, instructor, oh, I'm not getting bent. No way this can happen. So um, uh, what he did was he did not go to the next recompression chamber right away. He went home and just thought, oh, well, yeah, this uh, shoulder pain, oh, this is just hauling the tanks around or maybe exercise the day before. Uh, but eventually he finally uh, realized he probably had to go in. Um, first put himself on oxygen, uh, temporary symptom relief, uh, and then at the chamber he needed four treatments in four successive days. Uh, then symptoms were gone. And um, he thought then, oh well, a month later or so, let's do a very, very shallow dive, a few very shallow dives. The first few were okay. And then bang, came back in exactly the same spot, serious pain in the same spot, same kind of symptoms again. Uh, got another four chamber treatments. Um, and then this time he decided to stay out of the water for a half a year, came back, uh, fifth dive again, very shallow, nothing really to, uh, there, and uh, same symptoms again. So six months later in exactly the same spot. So the spot there, in some ways remembered where he got the first hit. And that would be consistent with our hypothesis here of scar tissue built up uh, from really a traumatic injury, some kind of cutting injury uh, in, your, in the spinal cord there. Uh, so uh, this is something, of course, in the moment, this is all anecdotal, some of it, much of it is speculation, so uh, I cannot make a medical recommendation to uh, change the treatment tables here, but I do think uh, these repeated treatments uh, may be uh, more problematic than they are uh, good uh, in some of those cases. So um, let me go to the last point that I would la might like to make. I've talked quite a bit about that we need some kind of seed bubble to get this bubble growth process going. So where are those seed bubbles coming from? Um, sp they cannot spontaneously form. If you get super situation in pure water, um, 
there is no, under these pressures, there is no way that it, that it can spontaneously bubble. Uh, you need to go have, um, so to have fluctuations that are large enough in pure water, so just thermal fluctuations, density fluctuations there, uh, you would have to go to a super situation that would correspond to diving to the depth of the Mariana Trench. Uh, so you don't do that. And so out of question here, not happening. So something else has to nucleate the bubbles. And bubble nucleation is, of course, quite well known. Um, uh, you, can, uh, you can think of a champagne glass here, for instance. Uh, you have your champagne, and um, then what happens is here you nucleate the bubbles. And uh, that you need bubble nucleation, by the way, I can also show you with a Pepsi can here. Um, earlier you saw how that one really spilled all over the place. If I now open this one here, that is just sat here for a while, nothing happens. Just a little and that's And both of them have the same amount of uh, carbon dioxide dissolved in the, uh, in the liquid here. So uh, the shaking doesn't dissolve anything more, and both of them were at equilibrium here. They have been sitting on the grocery store shelf for, for months or so. So uh, all that's different here is we have small bubbles that I introduced here. We had seed bubbles that I introduced in the first one through shaking, and I don't have seed bubbles in the one that I just opened here. So that's the role of these seed bubbles here. You need them really to get, get it to bubble there. And, um, yeah, champagne glass, how do you get your seed bubbles there? Uh, you usually have a rough surface. They actually grind a little piece here in the bottom of your champagne glass uh, so that you get these nice uh, streaks of bubbles uh, of, uh, in the champagne there. So uh, rough surfaces do it, hydrophobic surfaces. Uh, but so far, no one has come up with anything really good like that uh, in the human body. So uh, right now, most likely, how we get these um, these um, small seed bubbles to, uh, to start is in um, turbulent flow. Turbulent flow means you have shear forces, there, quite a bit of shear forces there in your flow, and um, that ca can give this additional, this additional force that you need to, to get over this initial hump to form a bubble. You get, uh, in, so turbulent flow can actually induce very small bubbles. Where do you have turbulent flow? Um, most of the blood flow is laminar, so no turbulence in most of the blood flow, with the exception of heart and aorta, there you have actually turbulence. So speculation here in the moment is uh, you generate very small seed bubbles in the turbulent flow in the heart um, and uh, in the aorta, and uh, then uh, they get transported into, uh, into the uh, deeper tissues and uh, eventually uh, grow into big bubbles there when you, uh, when you get, uh, get to the decompression part. So these bubbles here um, are constantly um, replenished through your circulation. And um, that's something we can also probe with our model gels here, a little bit at least. Um, we prepared gels where we try to pull out all these um, uh, these seed bubbles, so by degassing the, the gel here very, uh, first, and if we do that, we don't see any bubbles really springing up. And then the other thing that we did was um, we tried to really squash these little seed bubbles. Um, and the way we did that, we poured the gel in the liquid form, compressed it very quickly, uh, while it was still liquid. And that then, um, again, basically eliminated the, uh, all the seed bubbles. They were now really squished together through this initial compression. And uh, that's now different from actual diving, because in diving, yes, you would squish these initial bubbles when you uh, descend, but your circulation keeps going, keeps replenishing those little seed bubbles, and so you can't get rid of them. And that's really um, what's driving this uh, then uh, in the end here, why you are still uh, getting these kind of bubbles. So, um, and that pretty much brings me to the end of uh, what I'd like to present here. Um, so, in a nutshell here, uh, I hope I've been able to convince you that human physiology is affected by pressure, in particular, um, uh, so uh, pressure here, air pressure, what you're breathing there, and um, in particular this absorption of gas through Henry's law, dissolution of gas first in the blood and then into the tissue. And um, decompression sickness is not just a one very simple mechanism. It's actually a very, fairly complex interplay here uh, of um, physiology, 
um, the bubble formation mechanisms, so some of the physics there, uh, the bubble growth mechanisms, uh, then the response of the surrounding medium here. I think I've been, uh, hope I've been able to convince you that mechanical response of the tissue here of the spinal cord tissue is really, really important. Uh, so fracturing the spinal cord tissue is uh, what uh, may be going on here in many, many cases. And uh, that this can have potential consequences for how we uh, treat these kind of uh, these kind of uh, uh, illnesses. And physics, again, um, is helping us here to unravel all these uh, complexities and uh, hopefully uh, guide uh, this into the future. And um, with that, I'm reaching the acknowledgements here. Uh, I have a graduate student working on this, uh, Roman Alvarado. Uh, he has uh, been doing um, much of the uh, experimental side there together with uh, Cameron Hodges. Uh, he was a biophysics uh, undergraduate major, uh, graduated state another year at my lab uh, he's, uh, before going into, uh, into a clinical setting now. Uh, uh, radiation safety director at a hospital. Um, he, does, he has done the initial MRI uh, imaging. Uh, Adrian Bari, a talented undergraduate, he did much of the uh, gel work. Joan Grave, our collaborator in biomedical engineering. Osama Kashlan, um, a collaborator in uh, neurosurgery, providing the medical expertise. And uh, Josh Simmons, an undergraduate uh, who did the um, uh, finite element modeling. And I would also like to uh, thank the Divers Alert Network. Uh, they have provided funding uh, for this work. And finally, of course, uh, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, uh, Chris, for that great talk. Uh, I really appreciated all the technical detail there, and uh, I'm sure that our audience did too. Uh, some of those details raised a number of interesting questions, which I hope you'll, you'll uh, be able to address. You'll see. <laughs> so um, so um, I try to group these together a little bit uh, during the lecture. Um, <clears throat> There may, be, uh, there may be additional questions uh, from the audience uh, while we're speaking here, but let me start with a question um, to do with free diving. And um, that, maybe you can explain what free diving is, but the world record uh, apparently has been reported as something like 400 feet or 120. 120 meters, and um, how, how, how is that done? So, um, how is that? How is free diving done, and what are, what are the risks involved as far as decompression goes? Okay, I'm not a freediver, so uh, don't have uh, that training. So how it's done, freediving is without any scuba equipment. You just swim down, and yeah, uh, some can do this to amazing depth. Um, so the, the decompression risk there is basically not there because you're not introducing any additional nitrogen into the system. So yes, you have your initial lung full, but that's not that much, uh, the nitrogen that you have in that one lung full. Yes, some of that will go into the tissue, uh, but you're not keeping replenishing it. Uh, that's what you would do otherwise when you're on scuba, you keep replenishing it. And so uh, that uh, reduces just the amount of nitrogen that's available here that could get dissolved, and so you never get really into these uh, supersaturation situations. <laughs> I remember you made a point about not holding your breath, and presumably free divers have to do that because they're going down yes. so deep. Uh, um, but, but then um, they are not um, filling up their lungs with the compressed air that you are getting from your regulator. So for them, yes, the lung volume shrinks, but it, uh, it would never expand more than it, what it was at the surface because you're not pushing any additional gas into it. Uh, yeah. Oh, so that was an interesting question. And um, another question is to do with um, kind of aeros aerospace applications where, where instead of diving down into the ocean, you may be uh, going up into the atmosphere with a pressure decrease uh, during the ascent of an aircraft, for example. 
or or Jeb Bezos going up in a yep. in a space module uh, out to the edge of the atmosphere. What what kind of uh, pressures there are presumably the differentials are, are less than what you'd experience deep in the ocean, but what, what are the issues to do with aerospace? <laughs> well, um, in most situations, you, um, you ha still have, um, you, you're pressurizing the capsule or the uh, cabin, in, so on aircraft, the cabin is pressurized generally, uh, not quite to one full atmosphere, but the drop is sufficiently low that you generally wouldn't have to worry about unless you have been diving before and you're already super saturated. Then that difference actually makes it, yeah, can make a difference. So if you have been diving, you have been loading up on the nitrogen and then uh, go, uh, go on, on a flight to uh, whatever altitude, uh, then that additional reduction in pressure uh, can actually increase the super saturation and cause the compression sickness there. Uh, but going from one atmosphere to whatever the cabin is pressurized to generally uh, doesn't happen. Space capsules, capsules, the International Space Station is pressurized to one atmosphere. So uh, they're really at, uh, so while you're up there, nothing would happen. But again, uh, extravehicular activities, space suit pressurized to about a third of an atmosphere, 100% O2 though for that, uh, to keep the oxygen um, uh, partial pressure up. Um, and that actually is an issue, so they have to decompress relatively slowly, at least under normal operation. But there's always the worry, of course, what do you do if you have to get out, out of this right now, everyone getting your spacesuit out uh, or whatever, if something really goes really, really wrong. And then that's why NASA is worried about those type of scenarios, rapid pressure loss, uh, those kind of things, and uh, uh, space debris hitting the space station and depressurizing it quickly. Those, then, yes, that's why NASA is interested in it. Yeah. Um, so we had a, a number of questions about the mechanics of diving. Um, so one question um, that came in, which is quite interesting, is uh, to do with uh, the recovery of uh, uh, pure ox uh, using pure oxygen uh, uh, after diving back to a, a depth of, say, 30 feet, which is about one atmosphere, um, would, uh, would that intermediate kind of step uh, uh, help with uh, avoiding the bends or treating the bends? Which so, are fully so basically, the it's uh, from a deep dive up to a up ah. to an um, intermediate depth okay. and then waiting there. Um, ah, okay, yes. I think that's uh, the standard Yes, that's, that's procedure. the standard procedure. That, um, uh, so this is um, often uh, called stage decompression or accelerated decompression of oxygen. The way how that goes is you dive deep, load up on nitrogen, and then come up um, in stages slowly. Uh, but as you've seen, the, so of the last 10 meters are the most critical ones because there you're going from two atmospheres to one atmosphere. That's really where much of the action is happening. And so what you do then is switch your breathing gas from whatever air or whatever you have been breathing at depth. You switch it over to 100% oxygen. And uh, that has the advantage. Uh, now you have a, um, a partial pressure differential between your bubble. The bubble is now at 10 meters, so two atmospheres of pressure in the bubble to Nitrogen pressure outside is zero now because you are 100% oxygen. So now you, ha uh, you have artificially increased the gradient here, the concentration gradient, and you can wash out the nitrogen relatively fast, so typically about twice as fast as if you just did it on air or whatever your back gas is. So that way, yes, you can speed it up. Uh, it has other problems. Uh, oxygen becomes toxic uh, at higher pressures, uh, so uh, you have to, uh, so you can, so six meters for 100 percent oxygen uh, would be the limit. Uh, anything lower than that, uh, the additional oxygen would actually uh, call, uh, could uh, cause problems, uh, including, um, yeah, um, I think, I think it's mostly um, really yeah, neurological problems. Uh, you, would, uh, you would probably uh, get a seizure or something like that. So uh, this trick with the uh, pure oxygen works for the very last bit of your dive, the last six meters or so, to speed up the decompression process there. And it's, it's commonly done. Thank you. Um, so another question is, this is a classic kind of introductory physics question. 
how can our bodies operate in, in high pressures? Uh, um, and uh, specifically, yeah, the breathing mechanism. Uh, and I, I'm, yeah, yeah. the, like yeah. the breathing me mechanism works only when you breathe compressed air. You really have to have um, basically a balanced external pressure uh, on your lung here on the outside and uh, what's, uh, what's inside your lung. Uh, as soon as that pressure differential gets larger than something like uh, 0.2 atmospheres or so, you just can't do it anymore. Your, your muscles can't uh, really yeah, overcome this pressure differential anymore. So that's why you need to breathe compressed air at depth uh, to compensate for that. You have to more or less balance it, otherwise the mechanics won't work. To remember that's one of Newton's laws. Uh, yeah, all of that. <laughs> <Reaction>. <laughs> yes. yeah. Um, uh, kind of physiological question. Um, what, what's the cause of shoulder pain uh, in, um, in that was experienced yes. by one yes. of the diving yeah. cases there? Uh, is that a, that's a neurological? Uh, it seems to have been, it's very, these things are very hard to diagnose, and of course I wasn't there, and I'm not a physician, uh, but it's fairly common that you have, so if, I mean, you can pinch a nerve, and you know how that feels like, and this seems to be the kind of effect that they were feeling, that's, uh, that's all I can say there. It's fairly common, these kind of, sort of stinging pain, uh, again, like pinching a nerve, and, uh, but exactly the physiology there, uh, I'm, I'm not a physician. That's also... In the, in the muscles that yeah. have an imbalance in, in oxygen supply, I would imagine. Uh, that, or, or it might just be even the nerve somewhere else getting pinched off, let's say. Even if you have, let's say, a bit in the spinal cord or so, you can have still symptoms uh, further downstream. And uh, uh, so, but yeah, so it's most likely, I guess, the equivalent to a pinched nerve in some ways, what, uh, what the experience there is. And, um, and someone asked a question about how does this compare with altitude sickness? I, I think this is a different topic, uh, but uh, maybe you could say a few words about, yeah. about that. So uh, that, that is something that's been often sort of suggested offhand, and no one has ever really been made a clear connection there. I don't think it's, there's much there. So altitude sickness uh, is typically something like when you um, climb a mountain relatively quickly. Uh, most of the time it's headaches and so on, but it's still, everything is typically still slower than, the uh, than here, the differential nitrogen issues. So there's probably just, I think it's really just starving of oxygen, I think is really what the, what the main effect is uh, that you're seeing there. Just too little oxygen in the blood and, uh, well, obviously your, your brain cells don't like that and headache is, is the consequence there. So that's probably what's happening there. I don't think it has uh, anything to do with the nitrogen side. So this, this is a really nice question about the difference between um, DCS and nitrogen narcosis. And, and okay. the related yeah. question yes. is, uh, mm -hmm. why do whales not get, not get DCS? I remember going <clears throat> in New Zealand to um, have a, a lecture on, on a boat and do some whale watching, and, and the depths were incredible. There were um, many thousands of feet. So what, what's going on with... Okay, <laughs> the so the, yeah, okay. First, the nitrogen narcosis, uh, I haven't talked about that at all. It's an unrelated issue. Um, nitrogen narcosis um, is, or the only relationship there is, uh, the excess nitrogen that you have uh, can also get dissolved in the cell walls of your, uh, of your nerve cells and uh, change the properties there. Uh, such that it induces a bit of narcosis. Uh, most of the gases, most of the narcosis gases uh, work in, uh, that way. They get dissolved in the, in, the, in the cell membrane of your nerve cells and change uh, in still somewhat unknown ways uh, how the receptors there work. And if you go to high nitrogen pressures, that's what's happening is you're dissolving nitrogen in those cell walls and they change uh, some of the neuroreceptors there. And um, it is a Completely reversible process. You just ascend a little bit and uh, the effect is gone. Uh, the effect, by the way, is really sort of a narcotic effect. Um, de depends a little bit on uh, um, the situation and also on the person. What you ex exactly experience can be anything from feeling like a little bit stoned or so uh, to also more scary anxiety type issues. Uh, so for me, it's uh, warm water. It's sort of the nice and warm and fuzzy feeling. Cold water for me, it's sort of uh, 
I forget a lot of things when I do a cold, deep cold water dive. So uh, amnesia is something I have a little bit. So um, anyway, uh, this is solution of the nitrogen in the cell membrane of the, of the uh, nerve cells, exactly how it affects the, uh, the, uh, then the, uh, um, the receptors is uh, not quite known. Um, the whales, uh, that's, a, that's a good question and people are still looking into it. Uh, they, um, so, um, they have looked at um, also genetically if there are, if there are differences uh, in the various proteins that are involved uh, here and so on. Uh, but I think, I think it's still largely uh, not quite settled why some, some mammals can dive so deep without any of those obvious effects. Um, but what's actually known is even, even with some fish there, is, there are problems. Uh, so from people who go, who collect fish for aquariums, they often have to do, bring the fish up through some intermediate steps or so they can't just drag them out from, from depth uh, or they would just die. Uh, so there, there are some of those effects there as well. Right. So um, an, another related question or perhaps unrelated, is uh, can oxygen supersaturate in the, in the blood? Uh, uh, yes, it, well, supersaturate probably not. You're metabolizing the oxygen. But uh, for oxygen, there are two, two things here at play. One is exactly the same uh, Henry's law mechanism. You uh, get higher and higher oxygen pressures, more oxygen gets dissolved in the blood. But your oxygen also has hemoglobin in it, and that, bind, and that binds oxygen and transports it in. So for relatively lower oxygen concentrations, so here partial pressures like what we have here, 20.21 uh, uh, atmospheres or so, uh, it's all the hemo uh, bound to hemoglobin, and there's almost no free oxygen uh, in, the, um, in the blood. And uh, if you go uh, to higher oxygen concentrations, uh, then you can actually start pushing some into the blood, and that's where the oxygen toxicity comes in there. Uh, now, this nice regulatory mechanism that all your hemoglobin is saturated, and that sort of limits how much oxygen you usually get into the tissues, that goes out of the window once you start really getting to these high pressures and pushing it into the, into the uh, blood itself, uh, into the liquid, and that's where this toxicity comes from. I find it very interesting that you made a connection between uh, <clears throat> spinal cord injuries, which could be the result of, uh, you know, accidents at work or lifting, or and um, and and the damage caused by uh, decompression sickness. Um, as that, uh, how how is that field? Uh, did did you start that? Connection. It's, yes, it's so really this is something I sort of brought up to someone in particular. That's why I have the newer surgeon there uh, as one of my collaborators. And uh, so he thinks certainly this is very much a way of direction that we need to explore and think more about. Um, the unfortunate part is right now when you have a traumatic spinal cord injury, let's say from a car accident, in the acute phase they can do very little for you. Uh, they could get, get any bone pieces or so, out, sure, but otherwise there's really not much there they can do at the moment. And so even if we can prove that this is really a big mechanism here, uh, we still wouldn't quite know what to do clinically at that moment, uh, how to address the injury part. Um, although there might be something going in the, uh, in the other direction, can perhaps immediate recompression help in certain spinal cord injury cases where you have a gap or so that you could perhaps compress again. So that's in the moment sort of a bit of the speculation. Uh, maybe there's something there we don't know yet uh, at the moment. Yeah, so, so the medical community is beginning to uh, see the, the connection. Uh, that's, that's really good. <laughs> As yeah. it always goes when the physicist <laughs> talks to, <laughs> to the medical community. Um, as a, <clears throat> you know, what you've talked about and, and biophysics in general is a highly interdisciplinary activity involving many different disciplines, chemistry, uh, mechanics, uh, biomechanics, med medical uh, issues, physiology. Uh, as an applied physicist, which you, you also are, um, I always uh, ask the question, how can um, young uh, people entering the, the field prepare themselves for the, this world of, uh, you know, accommodating uh, all, all kinds of uh, different ideas from different disciplines. What, what kind of preparation uh, 
did, did you have in, in this? Well, so, so there are many, many, what, there are many, many you ways. Recommend? I think the most important part is just having the natural curiosity beyond your field. I think that's, that's, a, that's the, most, the most important part. Be curious about what's going on. If you, need to, uh, if you have a problem that you'd like to solve, if you need some physics for it, um, learn the physics that you need, learn, read up on the biology or whatever it is, just be curious and don't, don't just say, oh, I don't really know much about this area, I'm not going there, I stick with my specialization. So I think that's the biggest piece there. Be curious, be open-minded. Uh, preparation, of course, a good science background is always helpful. Uh, I, of course, like the physics background, tell everyone physics is the, is the thing to do. We sometimes say, yeah, physicists are the better engineers in applied physics, so uh, a little bit like that. Uh, physics helps. Easier to go from physics to biology uh, and medicine than the other way around. So I was trained as a physicist and actually got into the bio side uh, only during my postdoctoral uh, studies, uh, so fairly late. Um, I know quite a few people who have done it that way and relatively few who have managed to go the other way, let's say, as biology majors uh, later go into, uh, into physics. Uh, that seems to be rarer. Uh, and, of course, now we have also these interdisciplinary programs like biophysics, biomedical engineering, and so on. Um, so if you know, already know that that's the direction you'd like to go, those might be for you. Well, um, Chris, thank you so much. Uh, this is a very illuminating talk. And um, I, I'm going to just call from the audience if, if there are any other remaining questions. I, I see one here. Um, so let me bring the micros microphone. Thank you. Uh, you talked about bubbles forming inside cells. And I'm curious, you talked about diffusion from the, yeah. the, the cell liquid into the bubble, but the not, partial not, pressure, I'm sorry? Not, not, inside, not inside cells, in, t in the tissue, but not inside cell, actual cells. Okay, but um, it seems that uh, the, since the bubble is probably pure nitrogen, the partial pressure would be, you know, 100%. So how would, how would gas diffuse in? Because surely the partial pressure is lower outside the tissue than inside, outside um, the bubble inside. Now, uh, actually, in the tissue, you, um, you load the tissue up when you go, go deep. Uh -huh. Let's say to the equivalent of three atmospheres, four atmospheres, or whatever. And now you come up, the bubble expands. So the, par the, uh, the size of the bubble goes up and therefore the pressure in the bubble drops. Oh, okay. And now you have the gradient. So now, now, can, you, now, now, okay, yeah, now, now you treat it from the outside. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. If I've just been hired uh, for a James Bond movie uh, to fight underwater, um, and I'm, I'm in, involved in an aggressive uh, action at, 30, at uh, 10 meters, uh, how does that affect the... Uh, the decompression, uh, would that accelerate or uh, would that reduce the, the decompression requirements uh, after a, an extended fight scene uh, okay. where I'm trying it, busily yeah. to, to do away with giant James Bond? <laughs> yes. So, uh, okay, if you try, uh, try that and don't get shot underwater or anything, uh, then uh, the first thing that would happen is you risk for decompression sickness goes up dramatically. So um, you would like to basically hang there relatively still, have some very light movement just to keep the circulation going, not getting cold or those kind of things. But you definitely do not want to put strain or stress on any muscles. That's a known factor that leads to uh, decompression incidents. So when you do your decompression stop uh, and then do, oh, yeah, I can already unhook my tank, do this or that while I'm waiting here, uh, don't. Uh, is what we generally, uh, that's, that's a known factor there. Good. Well, if there are no more <clears throat> um, questions, I think that's all the ones that we received. Thank you very much, by the way, for, for all those interesting questions. And, uh, and th thanks again, Chris. Um, that concludes the uh, presentation for today, but I just want to take this opportunity to thank uh, all of our loyal sponsors and supporters of Saturday Morning Physics, and uh, we really appreciate uh, your support continuing through fairly difficult times with, um, uh, with the pandemics and, and all of that. Uh, I also want to 
express my appreciation for the for the uh, demo lab staff, and, and uh, I want to call out uh, Monica over there, who's done such a wonderful job, and her staff. Thank you so much for the, all the marvelous demonstrations. Simple, but very, very effective. And um, I want to also uh, point out that we will be having uh, our last lecture in the fall series um, in, um, in two weeks' time. And uh, that um, lecture will be given by Dr. Oliver Kripgans from the Internal Medicine Department in the, in the U of M Hospital. And he's going to tell us all about the latest developments in... Um, in uh, ultrasound imaging and uh, how the resolution of those images has, uh, has, has been uh, improving and he's been one of the pioneers of uh, methods to do that. And I, I noticed that you also had some, uh, Chris, you also had some ultrasound images of uh, bubbles and, and that's one of the things that uh, really comes out from uh, from the ultra, from the new ultrasound uh, uh, methods that are being used is to be able to image things like that. So um, I'm going to wrap things up for today, and uh, we will see you again in two weeks' time after Thanksgiving. Have a happy holiday. And uh, let's thank Chris again.